Well, good morning, church. Let's open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 22. If you're visiting Christ Church this morning, we're really glad you skated in here today. And uh, I'm really grateful that uh, we didn't get that freezing rain that was talked about for several reasons. One, I'm just glad we didn't. And uh, secondly, I'm grateful every time we get a chance to be together to encourage each other and to help strengthen one another as we continue to try to honor Jesus in everything we do. So we're really grateful you're here. My name's Mark, and I have the privilege of being on staff. And uh, so thanks for being here today. And for all of you that come each and every week, you, you make my week awesome. Thank you for being here as well. Uh, we are in this series through the Gospels, and we are in the final week of Jesus' earthly ministry. Now, uh, you know, every time I say that, I give myself a caveat. There's also things that he does post-resurrection uh, here on earth, but this one week... Uh, changes everything. It's the greatest blessing to ever happen to mankind is what takes place this week. And we're in the midst of it and we'll be spending a little bit of time on it. We are in Wednesday, Tuesday and Wednesday period of this week. But what's happened on Monday is Jesus went into the temple. This was the, the location, the social location and political and spiritual location of Jerusalem. Jesus goes in on Monday and he cleanses everything in there that is keeping people from having access to God. It would be represent. Uh, a, representation of what his ministry would do is to get rid of all the obstacles that keeps an individual from having access to God. He cleanses the temple and he's asked the question by the religious leaders of his day, by what authority do you do what you do? Why did you do that and who do you think you are? Jesus is about to enter into a lengthy period of time where he's answering the question, let me tell you who I am. The answer to these questions will get him killed. It's that serious of a conversation and it's going to take place over many, many passages of scripture, and we want to spend our time learning from them and growing in them. So last week, he began by telling two stories. The first story was about two sons that were asked to help their father with some work. One said he would not and did. The other said he would and didn't. And Jesus laid before us here that our actions matter, that the work of the kingdom God is inviting us into, and we get to choose whether or not we will actually do it. It's not as important what we say we'll do as what we actually choose to do. Then he tells another parable, another story. He talks about a vineyard owner who goes away for a season. He leases his land to a bunch of workers, and then he says, I want my share of it, and they refuse to give him his share of it, and everyone who he sends to collect his share is killed. And Jesus uses that story to say that there will be an accountability for every one of us with what we do with what's God's. These are judgment parables. They're not always comfortable, but they're always accurate. And so Jesus has created these two stories. He tells these two stories, and he enters into a third one, which is where we're at today. And this is the parable of the wedding feast. Let's begin in verse 1. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servant to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted ca cattle have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Happy Sunday. <laughs> All right, in the middle of this parable, Jesus is like, This is a judgment parable. And uh, God ain't playing. He's making a statement here about the kingdom. He says, he begins with, Jesus spoke to them again. Matthew records that Jesus continues building these stories so that there's understanding. And he's doing it in an incredible way. But what he says when it's, he spoke to them, he's talking to the religious people. He's talking to those people who like the fig tree that we talked about several weeks ago. The fig tree had leaves, but it had no fruit. What good is it? If it appears to be producing fruit and it produces nothing, he's talking to the religious. I will simply define a religious person is one who acts like Jesus is important. A Christian is someone who lives like Jesus is important. You see the difference? There's the impression that I'm interested in the things of Jesus, and that's like the son who says, yeah, I'll help you, but when time comes to do the work, they're like, nah, I'm good. There's a difference between the religious and Christians, the followers, the disciples, and Jesus was speaking to them because they're asking him the question, by what authority are you doing these things? You can almost hear implicit in their questioning of him is this is our temple. How dare you touch our stuff? You see, 
the religious people, especially the religious leaders, felt like they had earned their place. They had the credentials. They had the rabbinic training. They had everything. Jesus had none of those things. He didn't go to the rabbi school. He wasn't, he wasn't taught or mentored under one of the chief rabbis that trained. He didn't have any of their credentialing. So when they're asking him this question, it's a legitimate question, but they won't listen to his answers. They won't respond to what he's saying. And Jesus said, eh, this reminds me of a story. And he tells the story. Loving a good metaphor, I love when Jesus does this. Because he brings the theory into the real world and shows what it looks like. You see, the question that they're really asking is, is being a part of this kingdom based on merit or based on mercy? Is, is being invited into what God is doing, the father asking the sons to join him in the work, is that because they've earned the right or because he is giving them a blessing to participate in the work? Well, clearly, Jesus is teaching us that we are invited by the mercy of the Father, not by our own merit. So how does this mercy come to us? Let's use the story, and we'll draw three simple truths about mercy. Mercy requires a faithful response. We'll begin there. It requires a response to it. You see, people who don't believe they need mercy will never receive it. If, if someone feels like, they're being uh, placated or, or someone's doing a nice thing for them and they don't need the help. Many of us have a problem receiving someone honoring us or blessing us. We're like, no, 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 no. But in this case, those who know they need mercy know how to receive it. They realize without it, they can accomplish nothing. So a king holds a banquet, the wedding of his son, and he's inviting everybody into his goodness. The best wines, the best cheese, the best bread, the best foods, the best music, the, the best environment in this beautiful setting. And for the king to invite them into his goodness is a major statement. And the people that are invited say, yes, of course. Would you like to receive part of the king's goodness to you? Absolutely, I would love to. But there's a truth in Jesus' story, and it's this, and we all need to hold on to it. Anybody who is invited to enter into Jesus' kingdom only comes in because he invited them, not because they've earned it. None of us will ever be a part of the kingdom of God because we're due. We enter into the kingdom of God because he's kind. So the messengers go out to all those people who said they would come. The messengers go out and remind them. You see, a banquet would take a while to prepare. In my research, I discovered that it might take up to weeks for him to prepare enough food for all the people who would say that they were coming. And so the invitation is offered, they accept the invitation, and then messengers are sent out knocking on their door saying, the banquet will be ready in, in 24 hours, or the banquet will begin in 48 hours, and that would have been the time frame. Except when the messengers go out to all the people who said they would come, their response is, yeah, yeah you know, when I accepted the invitation, I wanted to come. But I'm busy. I, I've got this and I've got that. I got work. I've got family. My favorite ball team's playing. I just can't make time for this right now. It was a great invitation when you gave it to me, but I'm kind of preoccupied right now. And the king is insulted. So much insulted that he even says in verse 7 that he is going to, uh, how shall we say, terminate them. Because they dishonored the mercy and the goodness that he was offering them. They had decided that their stuff, their businesses and their fields were too important. It's simply simple to say they became indifferent. It, it, it sounded good when it was offered, but other things have become as or more important. And so, let's pause. Last week, the two parables we talked about was about promised obedience. This week, this parable is about promised preparation. They said they would come, great expense and work was put into the banquet, and then they decided, yeah, it sounded important then, it's not very important to me now. And before, like we did last week, before we move on and think, what a bunch of idiots, let's remember this parable speaks to us too. How many of us at one point in our lives thought the invitation into the kingdom of heaven was the greatest honor we could ever receive, and now we kind of look at it and go, yeah, but... As if the king arrived today, would our response be, today, I'm sorry, I'm not ready. I, don't, I haven't made time for it. I haven't made it a priority. I've been distracted by so many other things. See, you can have all of your life to prepare for the invitation, to receive the invitation and to experience it, but are you really preparing? 
You see, underneath their difference is something interesting. In verse 6, it says that they seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. You see, their indifference turned to hostility. Why? Because when the messengers came and said, but you said you wanted to come to this banquet. Why did you say you wanted to come and then not prepare yourself for it? So instead of hearing that and, and repenting and saying, you're right, I, I will get myself ready, they instead eliminated the messengers. And Jesus is alluding to the prophets who for centuries had been telling the people of Israel, God has given you the greatest honor that salvation is not for you, but salvation should come from you to all the world. And they had stopped preparing. And so when the king arrived, they were like, oh, is that today? I can't. I want to but I really didn't want to. You see, they seized him, they mistreated him, they killed him, and the undue honor of the king's graciousness was dismissed. The first group received the invitation, became indifferent. But there's another group that's about to be invited. And when they're invited, they have to ask themselves the same question I asked you this morning. Is the value of the invitation to sit at the king's table worth your everything? Is it your most important thing to receive the goodness and mercy of Jesus? Because this is what the parable is, is addressing. And maybe we need to be awakened to the reason. The reason that I'm going to challenge myself and everyone who will hear me this morning to not become indifferent to the promised return of Jesus is not so that you don't get punished. It's no motivation to say, you better get ready for Jesus or you're going to hell. No, the greater motivation of awakening is, let's get ready for Jesus so we don't miss out on heaven, so we don't miss out on the new kingdom, so we don't miss out on the promises of the graciousness of our king to sit at his table with the finest of wines and the best of foods and enjoy the greatest of fellowship that will not end. So you're thinking, your heart is like, if I'm honest, I'm not always prepared. I'm not always thinking about that. I'm, that's going to be one day down the line, but today, i got to worry about today. i got so many things going on. It's a new week starting. Tomorrow's Monday. I've got meetings. Am I ready? Am I got this? I got this. The kids got this. The wife's got this. i got all of these things going on in my world. And so we say to ourselves, I worry that I'm not going to be able to keep this life up. Or I think to myself, I've been struggling with the things and and I'm losing interest, and I, I don't know how to stop it. And some of us are saying, I'm, I'm, I'm failing. I'm, I'm trying to be good, and I'm not good at being good. Let me encourage you. If we forget that the mercy of Jesus is what invited us to the table, we can foolishly believe that our behavior maintains it. I want to say that again. It's a fallacy to believe or to, to stop considering that the reason I'm invited to the king's table is not because I've been good, it's because he's really good. And it's not about whether we maintain that, it's about whether or not the mercy of the invitation remains important to us. Because we weren't invited because we were good, we were invited because he's good. And remembering the goodness of the Lord is what will keep you interested. Remembering the goodness of the Lord is what will keep you motivated. Remembering the goodness of the Lord and how good it is will keep other things from becoming so important. You see, you and I are not getting his mercy by keeping up. We are simply keeping up only by his mercy. Verse eight. Then he said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready. But those I invited did not deserve to come. Go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. Verse 10 will mess you up. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find. Both good, church? All right, three people can read in a room. Let's try this again. Both good? Wow. That'll mess your theology up, won't it? And the wedding hall was filled with guests. I love it. When the good and bad are invited, it'll fill up. When the good are invited, not so much. But when the king came to see the guest, he noticed a man there who was not wearing clothes. Friend, he asked, wedding clothes, I'm sorry, that was a, <laughs> that was more than awkward. <laughs> yeah, you might notice that guy. Okay, let's start over, verse 11. When the king came in to see the guest, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. Friend, he asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. Any questions? 
It's awkward, isn't it? You have a couple of moments here where the king, uh, the king is not playing. For those that reject his mercy, they will face his wrath. And for those who reject the opportunity and treat it as insignificant, there's an accountability to it. You see, the second thing I want you to know is that mercy provides what we need. It, it not only desires and deserves a response, but it gives us what we want. Let me explain. So he says to his servants, when they come back and they say, many of the guests that you invited haven't prepared. They're not interested in coming anymore. He said, fine, I'll take care of them. But I want you to go out and I want you to go. And it uses an interesting term here. In the actual language, if you interpret it, it would say, go to the way that the ways cross. We would simply say, go to the public intersections and invite anybody who wants to receive the king's goodness. Invite those people to come receive it. And both good and bad people take advantage of it. You see, it's not, we're not invited to the banquet because we're good. We're invited to the banquet because he's really good. And people show up, good and bad. The reason they were invited, because they were willing. And I want you to know that Jesus calls all who are willing to follow him to follow him. That's all it takes. Are you willing to receive the mercy of Jesus? And the good and bad come in. But he walks over and he notices that there's a man who's in the wedding hall, who's not dressed in a wedding garment. Now, why is this important? I've always struggled with this. It's a text, my entire Christianity, I've read through it. I've not put enough study into it, and I always thought, man, this is just hard to hear. Everyone's invited in, and then one guy gets thrown out, and I don't even know what the rules are. Then I began to do some study, and I, I taught some important things. You see, this isn't about formalism. It's not about social convention. Simply put, this man thought he could come as he was. Let me explain. You see, when they asked him, why don't you have a wedding garment? He had two possible and very good reasons why he didn't have a wedding garment. He could have said, well, it took so long for the banquet to be prepared that when they told us, if you want to come to the banquet, come now. I didn't have time to run home and get my wedding garment. Or he could have said, I don't have a wedding garment. But in the parable, he doesn't respond. He remained speechless, which meant he just came as he was thinking, this is good enough. And the truth of the matter is, everybody else who came immediately was dressed appropriately. What does that mean? Most scholars believe that in that culture, if you arrived at the banquet, you were given a garment by the host that the king would have given everybody a wedding garment. And when this man did not put it on, he basically said, accept me as I am, and the king could not and would not. There's a valuable lesson here. Here's the point. There's a bunch of people who think that they're going to stand before God and go, "I, I earned this. I did right things. I did more good than bad. You need to let me in. And the answer is going to be, no, it's never been about you. You needed mercy, not justice. Because to stand before God and say, I've earned it, is to ask for justice, and justice is not your friend when you're a sinner. The second approach is to go to Jesus saying, take me as I am, and yet this guy is punished. See, listen to what Jesus is teaching us. Jesus is saying to us, if you'll allow me the interpretation, Jesus is saying, I will take anybody, but you can't come as you are. I will take every single one of you, but you must let me dress you with the garment, the wedding garment. You must let me put my righteousness on you and take off your filthy rags. To stand before God in our filthy rags, demanding of him that he take us as he is, we have not understood what Jesus came to do. You see, the Bible says there will not be one unjust deed that will not be paid. In other words, justice demands that our sin be accounted for and each and every single one of us give an accounting for what we've done. I love how Tim Keller points it. He says, now, if it's gonna be paid, there's two ways it gets paid. Either you pay it or you let Jesus pay it. You get to choose. And this parable is highlighting that. Are we allowing the righteousness of Jesus to clothe us Or are we standing before God saying, I think I've got it, I've done enough. Or just take me as I am. You see, God does not love people unconditionally. He loves them counter-conditionally. 
If God loved us unconditionally, no matter what we did, we're all going to be okay. It's not what the scriptures say. It says that God loves us counter-conditionally. It doesn't actually use those terms, but here's what that means. Counter-conditionally, instead of God saying, you fix it and then come to me and I will love you, he actually says, I will fix it. Will you love me? See how that works? Counter-condition is not you fix it so I love you. It's I'll fix it. Do you love me? And this is what he's offering us in Jesus. Charles Spurgeon in the 1860s had a wonderful phrase. He preached in London. He was one of the first, one of the largest churches ever known to that period of time. Thousands of people would come all week long to hear Spurgeon preach. And one of the things he said that I got was he said, beggars cheer for every dish offered to them. And this is what we're talking about today. Is the invitation as a beggar to sit at the king's table enough motivation for you to love God in return? It'll take a faithful response and he will give you what you need to enter the banquet. So mercy should become a daily celebration. What I want you to see here is that the person who gets thrown out, it's not the bad person. The person who gets thrown out of the banquet is not the person who owns no garment of their own. The only people that aren't allowed to enter into the banquet are those who feel like they, they are fine as they are. They don't need mercy. And this is what Jesus is saying to the religious people, to people that can often get caught up with, well, I go to the ceremonies, I go to the temple, I make the annual sacrifice, I do this. Isaiah chapter 61 verse 10 says, I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul will exalt in my God for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has wrapped me with the robe of righteousness. If Jesus doesn't give us his righteousness as an act of mercy, you and I will not enter the banquet. The question is often raised, how dare Christians think that they have the only way? I'm telling you that Jesus warned us not to make him superior to everyone else, but to show us there is no hope in anyone else. Without his blood cleansing us, we stand before him in filthy rags. The ones who are garmented in his righteousness given to them by the king will be welcomed into his graciousness and by his mercy they will eat forever and ever and work in his vineyards and do beautiful things. And those who stand in their own filthy rags arguing with him about his methodology are going to be sent out to a place of great pain and torment. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul wrote to a church that was full of good and bad people. And he wrote these words, Jesus Christ was made sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God through him. He was made sin for us that we then might be made the right that he might put his righteousness on us as we enter in to the great wedding. You see, because Jesus doesn't tell us this, but Paul will. Jesus is the bride, or we're the bride and he's the groom. We, the church, are his bride and he is preparing us. And he's going to take us in our filth and he's going to clothe us in his righteousness and he's going to take our filth upon himself and he's going to marry us and it's going to be the great celebration. It's going to be called heaven, not a place in the skies amongst the clouds but a new heaven and a new earth. There are some of us here trying to figure this Christianity out. I get it, and you're welcome here. We want you here among spiritual friends that can help you see what the scriptures teach and respond to it. And some of us are trying to figure the church out, and and let me tell you about the church. It will disappoint you more than it will entertain you. It will disappoint you more than it will ever be everything you want it to be. But there is something beautiful in our brokenness that allows us to know the mercy of Jesus. It's where his mercy excels. So you're starting to assess Christianity and what you believe. Listen to the words of Jesus and trust the mercy he's offering you. Don't stand before him saying, I've done more good than bad because that's not what you want is justice. What we all need is mercy. Around here, we talk about how do you engage your head, your heart, and your hands. I'd really like to walk through this this morning. Here's what I want you to think about this week. In a world that's made the things of Christ become indifferent, I want you to think about this. Remember your first love, not not your first boyfriend or girlfriend or your first crush. Remember the first person who ever loved you. When you read in the scriptures, you'll find out it was God. He's loved you from the moment you were conceived. And ponder the offer he's made to you. 
Spend some time, sometime this week, maybe even today, put the fire in the fireplace and sit by the window and on a cold, cold day, to remember how warm it is to be loved by God. Rejoice in the mercy of the invitation. Don't let anybody trade you anything of lesser value than that. To your hearts, what do we need to become? Celebrate the promise that are true. Worship him with gladness. Be grateful. Worship with your community and spiritual friends regularly. Coming to church doesn't save you, but trust me, being with spiritual friends in community will remind you regularly that the mercy of Jesus is the greatest offer you'll ever receive. Bow to nothing else but him and experience the peace and joy that knowing that Jesus' goodness is why you were invited and why he loves you is enough. And then for your hands, what are you to do with this truth? Well, for many in this room that are investigating Christianity and trying to figure it out, and even for many of us who at one point in time were very interested in the invitation, we accepted it, we made it our own, and now we find ourselves distracted and discouraged and pursuing other things, hoping today isn't the day he comes back because I'm not ready. Prepare your hearts. Say yes to the invitation. He's inviting you to become a part of his work. Not to work you to death, but to work you into life. Allow Jesus to dress you in his garment. How do you do that? Confess your sinfulness. Make a pledge before the Father to, to trust his words rather than your own feelings and your own choices. Give a declaration of faithful trust like that beautiful child just did a few moments ago where Zoe asked him the question, you want to follow Jesus with the rest of your life? And before she could spit it out, he'd answered. That's a confession of the lordship of Jesus. And then wash away your sins in baptism. Being obedient and submissive to a beautiful act that symbolizes our inclusion in the life of Jesus. And pray for the clarity of heart and mind to receive nothing as more important than the opportunity to be involved in the greatest act of mercy ever offered, the cross and the power of the resurrection. You see, there's something to think about, there's something to experience, and there's a response that we do with our hands and feet. Around the room, there are four tables this morning. These tables are gonna be filled with staff or elders of our congregation that would love to meet with you. For some of you today, you need to respond to the mercy that Jesus is offering you. There is an invitation offered to you today to become a part of God's kingdom, not because you're good enough, but because he is good enough. Confess, his, confess your sin, confess who you believe him to be, repent of your sin and be washed clean. If you've never done that, like you saw witnessed by a child this morning leading us, then go to this table while we sing or after service, we'd love to have a conversation with you. Maybe some of you wanna be prayed with and you just need your heart encouraged that the world has got you indifferent. And you want to repent of that and rededicate yourself to the principles of saying, I'm going to live every day with gratitude for what Jesus has offered me. That's why we gather, to strengthen one another, that there, your past does not matter as much as today and your future. Is there anything greater than the invitation Jesus has offered us to be a part of his table, to enjoy his presence, and to be blessed? Let's stand together.